Good evening. Welcome to tonight's event, the 29th annual Villabrook Memorial Lecture Beyond Villabrook. My name is Nora Santiago. I'm an urban policy analyst and co-chair of the Villabrook Legacy Committee at CSI. It is my honor to host this event tonight. I'm so pleased with the turnout. We have over 284 of you registered for this event. This event is part of the Year of Villabrook programming. Tonight, we will focus on what happened to residents after Willowbrook State School closed and hear from those who oversaw the transition to community care. Before we continue with our program, there are some housekeeping rules I would like to go over. Everyone will be muted during the event, except the speakers. After the panel discussion, we will answer some of your questions. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Please put your questions in the Q&A tab throughout the event. And uh, at the end, Professor Lavender will read them out uh, and the questions uh, will be answered by our panelists. This is a closed caption uh, event available by clicking on the CC button on, the, on your screen. We will also have a live ASL interpretation throughout the event. It is my honor to introduce tonight's host, Dr. Russell Rosen, Dr. Rosen is an Associate Professor of World Languages and Literature and Coordinator of the ASL program at CSI. He also coordinates a Disability Studies minor at the college. Please welcome Professor Russell Rosen. Thank you so much, Nora. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled to see all of you here. Um, in honor of Willowbrook and the Willowbrook legacy, the College of Staten Island and the buildings that are there are on the previous site of the Willowbrook School. And when that institution closed, the college decided to carry on the legacy, even though the patients and the staff were gone. And that includes education programs, that includes um, students who had IEPs, that includes setting up programs and centers for students to have accessibility, interpretive services like we're using tonight, assistive technology, um, things for students with disabilities. So they've carried on that legacy and I'm very proud to see that. And one of the strongest um, is the School of Social Work. They have a minor program in the disability studies as well. This is one of the strongest areas where we see this carry on the legacy. Um, and there are also several courses like, for example, Introduction to Disability Studies, uh, looking at different perspectives of disability. And we look at students and what programs they're going through and their trajectories to see the different fields where sociology, communication, psychology, social work, education, special education, and so forth, how these students are carrying on the legacy as well. So the Disability Studies minor has been around for almost um, 40 years, and it's one of the proudest opportunities we have here is this Willowbrook lecture. It's one of our proudest moments. And we, we really value the professor emeritus of the college of Staten Island, the president of the college, and those who have, who have kept this going. Also with collaboration between the Disability Studies minor and the Willowbrook lecture series committee, we can focus on what's happening with former residents of Willowbrook, how they transitioned out of the school, and what happened to them, and how, what their what their plans changed, what happened, and then what we learned from their experiences. So I'm really thrilled to honor and to invite today Ronnie Cohn. Ronnie Cohn is a leader and an advocate for the Willowbrook uh, legacy and the lecture series. Um, a legal advocate. She's worked in the area of disabilities. So please give a warm, warm welcome to Ronnie Cohn. Ronnie? Ronnie, Ronnie you're muted. You just muted yourself. 
Oh, I just unmuted myself. Now you're good. Now you're good. Oh, you <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, I am very excited to be here tonight and to introduce the commissioner of OPWDD, who is joining us for the entire evening tonight. Commissioner Carrie Neifeld is here with us, and she will she brings greetings now, and she will also be here for the question and answers after after we after the presentations. So um, the the floor is now opened to the commissioner. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Neifeld. I'm the new commissioner at OPWDD. Um, and I emphasize new, I'm in my fifth month on the job and I am very excited to be here in this role. Some of you I have met already, um, some of you I have, are meeting for the first time and I'm very excited to be here this evening participating in this discussion and happy to stay on um, for the whole, um, for the whole uh, program to hear the discussion and then also to participate in the question and answer. I think part of what is really important for me um, as the commissioner of this agency and, you know, you know, one of the individuals who has the privilege of leading the system is for me to really understand the history of how OPWDD was developed and why. And I think hearing directly from folks who have been around and were here, um, you know, and are honoring the 50th um, anniversary of the expose of Willowbrook and have been here for that whole story, I think it's really important for me to hear that and to honor that. Um, and I think, you know, the, I, I, I won't be able to quote it perfectly, right, but history can be repeated if we don't um, acknowledge history, right? And I think it's really important, um, you know, to, to recognize the history of this system. And I think, um, you know, it, we are at a, a really interesting point in our, in the story of our system and the story of our, of OPWDD and the folks that we serve and their families, um, you know, in a post Willowbrook world where we have um, you know, deinstitutionalized, and then um, you know had another opportunity to look at developmental centers and move away from developmental centers and really move into community-based living for the individuals that we serve and support. Um, you know, I, I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting time to reflect on our history, and a, it's a great inflection point as we continue to move forward and be progressive in the supports and services that we provide to individuals with um, developmental disabilities across the state of New York. I'm very excited also to be representing Governor Hochul, who has already in her short time as governor been a champion for the work that we do. Um, her state of the state address in January um, talked a lot about OPWDD, the supports and services, our providers and the individuals and the families that we support. And then in, in addition to that, her executive budget proposal, which came out in February, um, provided a 12% increase for the OPWDD budget, which is the equivalent of $500 million. It's the largest increase this agency's budget has seen in a very long time. And um, together with our providers, with the families, with individuals we serve, self-advocates, we'll work on making sure that that money gets spent in the ways in which um, you know, we all have prioritized. Um, I look forward to working on, on you know, those priority projects and those priority issues with you, with our providers, with our self-advocates. Um, I know that the Willowbrook class members and their families, um, you know, represent our history, represent where we need to go as a system. And I'm very happy to be here tonight um, to share in this dialogue with you. So with that, I will, um, you know, give way to the program and happy to share um, in question and answer at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, now we, I would like to, I'm going to just introduce you quickly, just by name, to the, um, to the panelists, and then we'll talk a little more about how, how everybody got to where they are with Willowbrook shortly. Um, so joining me are now Kathy Broderick um, and um, Tony Ferguson and Beth Rolls, there you are. And uh, we will we'll all be sharing our experiences related to Willowbrook. But so right now, um, I'm just going to mention that I've been the I've been involved in the Willowbrook case since 1972. Um, and I there, there are so many, there are so many different iterations that we that have we've gone through, and so many times that there was litigation, and so many times that there were other things to share. But um, everybody in 
all of the panelists have all played huge parts in all of this. Um, so I'm just going to go right into talking a little bit, and I'll introduce each person as their with their background as um, as soon as we as soon as we start. So on January 6th, 1972, Geraldo Rivera introduced his television audience to Willowbrook. On February 26th, 1972, a New York Times editorial entitled The Willowbrooks With Us said in part, it is part of the tragedy and the disgrace that in human conditions at Willowbrook, a state facility for the mentally retarded on Staten Island have persisted through repeated exposés and full dress inquiries. The current storm over degradation of the human beings institutionalized there must not be allowed to fade away in still more inaction. Fade again, please. I got it, I think. Okay. Maybe. How do you hear? Okay. Um, the, 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 this editorial that I just quoted from is available in full in the recently published book entitled Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional America by Dr. William Bronston, who I think just came onto the Zoom. So if you have questions for him, he'll be there. Um, in June 1972, I graduated from Queens College, which is part of CUNY. And after seeing and reading about the horrors of Willowbrook, I went to work for the then labeled Association for the Help of Retarded Children in New York City to participate in moving people out of Willowbrook. And I've never left this field at all, albeit at times working on different cases and in different places from New York. So fast forwarding as we move into <laughs> Willowbrook. Um, in 2005, Will, the Willowbrook Wars book by David and Sheila Rothman said, Willowbrook itself is history. And that is, that is really true. Willowbrook started so many of the things that we all got to know about afterwards. And um, in, in, in a very significant way, carved the road for others. The transfer of residents from Willowbrook was not without points of conflict, several of which had to be resolved in federal court. And you will hear more about this from our panelists. By September of 1987, the closure of Willowbrook was publicly celebrated. The closure, however, was by no means the end of the case and much remained to be done, which is best part to tell. By 1993, a permanent injunction had replaced the original consent decree. And it was time to evaluate how people who had moved into the community were doing community services and were, excuse me, commun community services were being developed and there were new standards of care. As the independent evaluator, I worked with the state, the New York Civil Liberties Union, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and the community advice, the Consumer Advisory Board, and probably some others to develop a monitoring tool to assess how class members were faring over the past several years. The first group reviewed was 350 class members, and they were clearly better off than they were when they lived in Willowbrook. However, it was also clear that improvement was still required in order to comply with the standards that had just been used. For example, case management services were insufficient, as were recreational and social activities. Living arrangements were often not home-like, and community integration was not nearly achieved. We were not looking at the horrors of Willowbrook, but much remained to be done to enable class members and hopefully others who resided with them as well to enjoy their entitlements. Following the first round of reviews, following the first round of reviews, those most involved with the class members had this to say. The then director of the Consumer Advisory Board said, Although a large percentage are getting appropriate care and treatment, there are still a large number of people who have not received the high quality of care promised by the permanent injunction. That at New York Civil Liberties Union said, the folks in the Willowbrook class are probably better off today than they were in the past, 
but advocates and attorneys have to remain ever vigilant to ensure that today's quality does not deteriorate. There is a real risk that the same atrocities can happen and we have to keep as many eyes on as possible. So thanks, thanks to Beth <laughs> for bringing that up in that situation. Um, as the independent evaluator, I said that the class members are better off than they were before, but there are still issues of community inclusion, protection from harm, and compliance with entitlements. And finally, a then Willowbrook consultant said that the class is better off than it was in the past, but it's just not enough. At that point, OPW and the plaintiffs then agreed that a more robust quality assurance system was needed and more independent inspections were required. There have been many iterations of this type of quality assurance and the parties along with the parents to this day at quarterly meetings discuss overall systemic concerns, status of individuals and their homes and more. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was. Looking at more current times, just some of the areas that we are still talking about that still need to improve are related to nursing homes and hospitalizations, difficulty recruiting and retaining staff, residential closures and consolidations, aging of the class members, the pandemic, parents' concerns, maintaining the entitlements of the permanent injunction. It's better than it was, but there is more to be done. And yes, Willowbrook itself is history. So right now I'm going to introduce, who am I introducing? First, I'm introducing Kathy Broderick. So Kathy joined, oh, I'm sorry. Kathy began her career in OPWDD, then OMRDD, in 1978 as a special education teacher for the Howard Park Children's Unit of the Bernard Science and Developmental Center. This was just when compliance with the landmark Willowbrook Consent Decree was moving into full speed, requiring New York State to move 5,000 residents of the infamous institution into the community. Over the next 15 years, Kathy moved into positions of progressive responsibility until 1993 when she was appointed Deputy Director of the New York City Regional Office to assist in the implementation of the newly initiated Community Services Expansion Program, soon assuming total responsibility for this program. In 1987, she was appointed Associate Commissioner of OPWDD for the entire New York City region, a position she held until 2010. Kathy joined the AHRC, New York City family, as a senior staff member in 2010 and now serves as a trusted advisor. She has provided her valuable expertise to AHRC, New York City, over the years and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, supporting efforts to keep our programs operational and staff as safe as possible. So Kathy, join us. Everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. I do want to just take a minute to thank the Legacy Committee and Dr. Rose and the uh, continuation of the year of Willowbrook uh, is so critical. Uh, as we, I think, heard many times, uh, history is the opportunity to learn and we can never repeat the negative history at Willowbrook. Um, as Ronnie indicated, <laughs> my first job was as a direct support staff. Um, and my first job there was to actually go screen children and adults who were living at the Willowbrook State School for movement to one of the local developmental centers. I was actually working for Bernard Feinstein at that time. And while um, I was young um, and naive, nothing could have prepared me for what I witnessed in Willowbrook, nothing. Um, the lack of services, the lack of humane conditions, the lack of recognition of people was um, something that was pervasive. 
But the goal, and I think that the um, consent decree really started this journey to improve the lives of the Willimer class, as well as the lives of all people with IDD. So we brought people out of Willowbrook, and in some cases, people were able to go right into the community, but the community operation and size of the community operation was very small. So they came to the local developmental centers. Um, basically, they were set up in localities. Um, every borough had one in New York City, different counties had one, and the goal was to bring people back as close as possible to their families. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who know me know that I am slightly obsessive compulsive, um, and I keep records. <laughs> And I went back to look at the initial group of people who moved into Bernard Feinstein Howard Park Unit, and there were 242 individuals. Of the 242, 228 were class members. Of the 228, um, it shocked me to realize that only 13 had active family and um, I think as I got to meet families and encourage them to reconnect with their loved ones, it became apparent that they had been overwhelmed by Willowbrook and uh, were not always viewed as positive influences and therefore kind of retreated. But I am, many of the families that I met in 1978, 79, um, I'm still involved with. We're all getting old, but we're all hanging in there. Uh, and it, uh, they made a tremendous difference. Again, the goal was to afford people that are lives in a developmental center. It was an ICF. And what we learned very quickly was, while it was better, it was not the goal. Uh, we were able to start education uh, for the, some of the children. As you know, Public Law 94-142 came into being, which guaranteed people the right to a free public education. Many of the Willowbrook class children, and I'm talking 11 years old, 12 years old, when we first tried to get them admitted into the local public schools, um, the schools were not prepared to um, support uh, some of these individuals and kids. Um, the goal, again, of course, was to provide supports, a better life, but ultimately a move to the community where they could flourish. Uh, the voluntary providers and the state, um, OMRDD at, the point, at that time, worked extremely collaboratively to develop the community-based services and support families and individuals who were either at Willowbrook or, Lit or the DC. Um, ironically, and I'm sure many of us remember, when there were some families who may have resisted move to the community, because it was, again, an unknown. Um, eventually, everybody that lived at Bernard Feinstein um, that came from the Willowbrook State School was successfully transitioned into a community-based opportunity. Three things helped that. Definitely collaboration. <laughs> Definitely a partnership with the Willowbrook parties and the Consumer Advisory Board to help foster this um, level of comfort for families when we were proposing community operations. The state devoted a great deal of time and energy into the development of community operations. And there became known a rule, and the rule was the 50-50 rule. <laughs> because while people were being moved out of 
the developmental centers and into the community, the community-based families who had children and adults living at home with IDD were desperate for supports and services. Um, the, half of the new residential opportunities were afforded and offered to families who had loved ones at home based on age, based on situation, but they needed support. Simultaneously, uh, <coughs> supports in the community also started being developed. Non-residential community supports. Most of these were identified, designed by parents, by family members, by advocates, and they were developed as a result of a local government plan. People just didn't go develop or start new programs. They were developing in accordance with what people wanted, when they wanted it, and how they wanted it. As sad as it is to say, Nobody should have ever had to live in Willowbrook. Nobody. <laughs> However, as a result of that horror, and the many of the people on this webinar, many new services were developed. Um, the state opted into community-based services and ultimately the waiver um, and created opportunities. That's kind of my history. <laughs> my cautions <laughs> to everyone is, Willowbrook was a one size fits all. And the developmental center was also a one size fits all. We need to make sure that what we do today, tomorrow, and in the future does not have that viewpoint of one size fits all. Um, independent living isn't for everybody. <laughs> A supervised diary isn't for everybody. Um, and there are certain people with such high level needs, whether behavioral or medical, that they need a system of supports that can be there when they need it and what they need it. Um, I touched on the local government plan being critical to what was developed. I really caution us to make sure that that planning process continues to go on involving families and local stakeholders and government and, of course, members of the Willowbrook um, movement. Scary to me. And one of my roles in the community service plan, we would celebrate on a yearly basis if we were able to open up 500 new residential opportunities. We celebrated it because it was what was needed and we were barely keeping up with what was needed. When I look today and hear that our residential <laughs> wait list has top 10,000, that concerns me that how easy it would be to say, well, I guess we need to open up institutions. That can't be the answer, but so we have to devote new opportunities to support people on that wait list. Um, Staffing crisis, I, I'm, in, in addition to being a little obsessive compulsive, sometimes I give people the benefit of the doubt too much. Um, and when I met many of the staff at Willowbrook, none of them that I had the pleasure of speaking to, none of them had the intent to harm. They were placed in a situation where rather than not shower people, they would use a hose so they could get 20 people cleaned at one time. When I heard that, I was um, shocked, um, somewhat saddened. But when you speak to those staff, they will tell you in their heart of hearts, they felt they had no choice. There was not enough staff. There was not enough hands to truly take care of the people that they were charged to take care of. Um, 
We have a staffing crisis right now that is preventing agencies from opening new homes, preventing people, including the state, to fill vacancies because we don't have enough staff to manage uh, additional people. I think the pandemic showed us just how critical um, our system of support is. Our direct support staff and the clinicians that work in these programs were nothing less than heroes. They came, they took care of the people we support. They had their own families. In some cases, um, a couple of them did not go home for weeks on end. While those are my cautions, I am hopeful uh, when I hear the commissioner address the elements of the proposed budget, that gives me hope because for the last decade, I do believe that a perfect storm was created to dismantle what we have achieved. Um, and I'm hopeful that with the new governor and the new commissioner, recognition and hope to the field that has been neglected too long is now in the forefront. I would have loved to say today, and I'm sure the commissioner would agree, that the budget was passed, but it wasn't passed yet. They're still negotiating, but I'm still hopeful. Um, the perfect storm was created. It placed this system in a non-positive light. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there are times we will never, we will not agree. But hearing the commissioner and the governor and the proposed budget and many people on this webinar, I believe we will get out of the storm. Collaboration, working together uh, is the goal to provide the best possible supports that people deserve. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and uh, next, um, Beth Ferulis will be uh, joining. And Beth joined the New York, New York Civil Liberties Union as a staff attorney in 1994. Um, at, the, at the New York Civil Liberties Union, she is responsible for developing and executing complex litigation with respect to constitutional and civil liberties issues, providing technical assistance and advice to the ACLU and the New York Civil Liberties affiliates and, and cooperating attorneys engaging in a broad range of public education activities, public speaking, including major addresses, um, testimony, providing articles for professional journals, and much more than that. Um, uh, Ms. Rules works on a number of disability justice matters and is lead counsel for the Willowbrook class, for the Willowbrook class action litigation and served as lead counsel for Hirschfeld versus HHC Kings County conditions litigation. She has also served as a member of the advisory council to the supported decision making New York project and um, and many, many others. And I can say having worked with with Beth, I don't know how she has more than 24 hours a day, but she does. So go ahead. Thanks, Ronnie, and thanks to all of you um, folks at College of Staten Island, in particular for establishing this forum for this very critical topic this evening. And obviously, thanks to everyone who is participating tonight and everyone who is in the Zoom audience. Um, it is very critical that people continue to bear witness to what occurred at Willowbrook um, to prevent those circumstances from being duplicated in the present. So what I thought I would do tonight is sort of give you a little bit of an overview of what the original litigation was, um, how the litigation transitioned from an institutional conditions monitoring case to a community-based services delivery system monitoring, um, and then sort of just get into some of the day-to-day -day things that um, we and my colleagues at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest or our co-counsel um, work on. Um, so as we've heard, uh, Willowbrook litigation was started on March 17, 1972 in the Federal District Court for the Eastern District of New York, because Staten Island is in the Eastern District of New York. Um, there was a consent judgment entered after three years of pitched battle. Um, yeah, I was not there in 1972, obviously, 
um, but my colleagues at the NYCLU, uh, joined by colleagues at the Legal Aid Society of New York, also joined by colleagues from the Department of Justice, um, brought the cases, because there are two cases, um, against the state. Um, governor Rockefeller was the governor at the time. Um, after three years, the state, with the panoply of attention and focus that had been caused by the Geraldo Rivera expose, finally agreed to um, enter into what's called a consent judgment, which is basically an agreement between the parties that is then ordered by the court. And the federal court retained jurisdiction over the case and continues to retain jurisdiction over the case. The permanent injunction was entered in March of 1993. Um, that injunction, um, also a consent judgment, shifted the focus away from the institutional conditions that required rectifying to the nature and scope of services, as well as protection from harm that are due to Willowbrook class members who were being placed in the smaller residential settings that you heard Kathy talk about in the community. Um, this was considered to be a public law social reform litigation. Okay, that's a lot of words. Um, we call it impact litigation. Um, it was a case that was one of the first cases that tried to advance the rights of people with developmental disabilities. Um, the case was mirrored in a number of states around the country, but what's different about the Willowbrook case is that the duration of the Willowbrook permanent injunction is measured by the life of the last living class member. There is no other consent judgment in the country that is tied to the complete existence of the living days of the class members. And I don't think there's any other consent judgment that's in place that has plaintiff's counsel both ethically and legally and morally um, committed to, obligated to act as officers of the court on behalf of the class members through the end of the life of the last class member. Um, the conditions inside Willowbrook were not wholly unknown. Um, I think we, many of us are aware that um, in 1965, Robert F. Kennedy, who was the New York State Senator at the time, had paid an unannounced visit to Willowbrook and denounced the conditions. The Kennedy family had an interest in institutions like Willowbrook because his sister, their sister, um, Rosemary, who had had a frontal lobotomy performed on her, um, was thought to be developmentally disabled. When he went to Willowbrook, he described the facility as a situation that borders on a snake pit. That was 1965. The families, the advocates, the staff inside, and I think we have some of them on the call tonight, um, worked as hard as they could do uh, to try to rectify the situation. Um, but it took the litigation that was mirroring the disability justice movement that started in the 60s to really kick things, I think, into high gear. And here we are tonight. Um, it was a watershed case. Um, it set little known to many people important precedents for the humane and ethical treatment of people who lived in institutions. It served as the impetus for accelerating the pace of community placements for people with IDD. It expanded community services. It increased the quality and availability of day programs and it actually established a right for children with disabilities to a public education. So the goal of the Willowbrook litigation was to guarantee people with IDD fundamental basic enumerated rights, including obviously the right to be protected from harm, but it also advanced the opportunity to live in community residential settings and to be provided with meaningful and inclusive community activities and services. You'll hear probably more from Tawny Ferguson, um, but there's about 2,000 of the original 6,000 class members who are still alive. They range in age from 50s, because remember, these were people who were infants, all the way up to some of our centenarians, people in their hundreds today. Uh, the class reside in a variety of residential settings from Long Island up through Western New York into the North Country, Probably uh, two thirds of the class are located in the downstate area, as you would expect, given the fact that Willowbrook was in fact placed on Staten Island. Um, we have class in independent living, we have classes living 
obviously in more restrictive settings uh, to provide the supports and services that they need. The important thing I think to think about Willowbrook is that the case was actually, it preceded by some 25 years, the Olmstead case from the Supreme Court, uh, where the Supreme Court indicated that people with disabilities had the right to live in the community in the least restrictive setting that's appropriate for their needs. Uh, the Supreme Court gave states a monetary out in Olmstead. Um, that monetary out, again, <laughs> another aspect of the Willowbrook case does not exist in the Willowbrook permanent injunction. Um, our injunction provided for people to live in the least restrictive and most normal living conditions possible. Um, that was really a seismic change from a medical model of care. Um, the injunction has set up a very robust monitoring protocol. Um, I think it's difficult for people who are working in the field who don't have sort of core muscle memory knowledge. Um, there are a number of people, the injunctions major accomplishment amongst others was to set up a belts and suspenders system so that you have the Willowbrook independent evaluator. You have the consumer advisory board who act in loco parentis, who are on the ground across the state, serving class members, knowing them in the community, advocating for them and bringing to our attention and more importantly to the state's attention various critical deficiencies in the nature and level of the services provided, systemic problems, and obviously violations of individual rights. The CAB's mandate is enormously broad. They were created by a 1975 order of the federal court that exists to this day. Um, we depend on them fundamentally because they are our eyes and ears. Um, we also have two Willowbrook consultants who were formerly employed in the Office of the Special Master. Um, and then we have a Commissioner's Task Force on Willowbrook, which is a little different than most state uh, task forces um, insofar as that task force cannot be disbanded. Um, there are members of families, um, obviously advocates, other professionals who are sitting with um, the Commissioner and with the Commissioner's delegated representatives um, on a quarterly basis every year to talk about systemic issues, posit systemic change, and advocate for very um, critical uh, improvements and tweaks in the system. Um, the class members are entitled to high quality community residential treatment services, protection from harm, a safe, clean, and appropriate physical environment, high quality care management, advocacy services, um, there is a due process notice with respect to community placements and programs. Um, class members can voice grievances. They're entitled to incident review. They have quality control audits that are more frequent than most people living in OPWDD certified settings. Um, and certification, obviously, of both their residential and habilitative and medical services. Uh, for compliance with all applicable federal, state, and local regulations. And again, as I say, the court retained jurisdiction over this case, uh, which is also not a common uh, jurisdictional retention that most courts today um, will, will take. Um, the things that we do under the injunction sort of vary on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we've tried to split up. New York lawyers and I, um, the tasks. So New York lawyers basically will take uh, due process notices um, and they receive notices of death. Um, at NICLU, we get all the incident reports. We deal with protection from harm. Um, we take the lead generally on guardianship issues, end of life issues, medical consent and research initiatives during the COVID pandemic. Um, we, with the CAB, were called upon to um, provide commentary and effectively super consent to the utilization of the vaccines that had been developed and were promulgated under an emergency use authorization, because those are really still experimental um, injections. Um, folks may recall that the world of class were subjected to horrific medical experimentation, including injection with hepatitis B 
in order for the Department of Defense and the United States government to develop the hepatitis B vaccine. Um, we have a provision in the injunction that came from the consent judgment that prohibits any sort of invasive, intrusive, experimental, um, or any research activity performed on the class without strict adherence to institutional review boards and consent of plaintiff's counsel and the consumer advisory board. Um, we also deal with expansion of residential program requests. We provide testimony and comments on regulatory initiatives, legislative enactments, programmatic initiatives that um, New York State DOH, OPW um, might engage in. Um, again, this monitoring structure just contemplates that plaintiff's counsel are interwoven into a variety of activities we generally, as Kathy indicated, try to work in collaboration um, with the state. We certainly, as I say, work in collaboration with the CAB, with the independent evaluator, with the Willowbrook consultants, with families, with individuals, um, and with any of their advocates. We also work with the mental hygiene legal services. Um, there are two sets of attorneys that represent Willowbrook class members. Um, in New York State, most folks who live in uh, any sort of OPW certified setting are represented by the Mental Hygiene Legal Service. Um, they are our sort of backup um, on a number of issues. They generally obviously defer to us with respect to the injunction, but will oftentimes engage in a, a dual representation uh, pincer movement <laughs> to advance the class members' rights. Um, you know, there are so many issues that come up. The class, you know, led the formation of the system. Um, the class as they age should be, in fact, informing the development of additional services that are appropriate to people who are aging. People with IDD should not, unless they choose to, have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and get on a bus to drive, be driven for hours to a day program. Um, people should have the right to retire and to engage in you know, activities that are meaningful to them during the course of the day. That is very difficult these days um, with the staffing issues, with the pandemic, close downs and the like. Um, but even with respect to medical interventions, because as the class age and remarkably given the benefits that have flowed to them, people with IDD, people in Willowbrook class um, have very long lifespans. Um, most of the records that I've seen from um, class relating to their initial um, enrollment at Willowbrook um, carried at the time that sort of low expectation of decreased lifespan. Um, so, you know, as I say, we do have class members, you know, they're the baby boomers, they're the rubella babies from the 60s um, who are reaching, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100. Um, we are called upon to answer all sorts of odd questions. Um, <laughs> you know, originally when I started on a case in 1994, um, we were working in concert with OPW, then OMRDD staff, um, including counsel, um, who emerged from the crucible of the Whit Willowbrook litigation. Um, that workforce was steeped in 30 years of accumulated knowledge, talking about institutional knowledge, um, about both the case and the formation and development of OPWDD as an institution. Because remember, the consent judgment in the Willowbrook case was a 44-page single-spaced document that dealt with 23 areas of expertise, ranging from environment, direct care staff, education, recreation, dental services, food and nutrition, all the way down to community placement, records keeping, and you know the advisory boards and volunteers. Um, it was a very um, proscriptive document, but you can see in the years the development of OPW regulations that very much teed up to and mirrored the mandates of the consent judgment. So the entire system, well, what the case did was to actually create a system, um, had been in place and was, you know, rolling along. But, you know, I've seen um, over the years, 
the impact on the agency and on the people served with the accelerating waves of retirement. Um, we've had retirement from the top echelons of the central office in Albany, all the way down to the direct care staff. These retirements have really eliminated highly experienced, knowledgeable, and dedicated people um, with wide, widespread loss of job lines. And, you know, I've called it the brain drain, and I've insulted the New York State Attorney General's office by calling it that. But you lose an awful lot um, if, if there isn't a way to sort of pass that knowledge on. And with years of hiring freezes that predated the last decade, um, there was a real diminution of the state's ability to actually transfer hands-on that accumulated information. Um, over the past eight years, we also have retirement set against the backdrop of this rollout of a Medicaid managed care long-term support system. Um, it has been a very uncertain rollout. The only thing that has been certain about the rollout is the rate rationalization process that New York State DOH and OPW have put into place. They negotiated with the federal court um, it basically has destabilized, I think, all of New York State's human services delivery system and really plunged it into increasing disarray and turmoil. The pandemic has not helped, um, but the system was deteriorating and degenerating before the pandemic started. We at the NYCLU are often called upon to educate new state employees and private provider agencies and their employees, including the care coordinators, on basic issues that relate to the Willowbrook entitlements and the expectations that both we and defendants counsel the state um, share with respect to defendants compliance. Um, our work, as I said, is conducted almost lockstep with the CAB with advocates, the care managers. Because we serve this function, we also have OPWDD personnel around the state contacting us. Um, obviously, we are always available to family members, um, including family members who come late to the knowledge that they have a Wilbur class member in their family because their parents did not disclose that to them during their lifetime. Um, those calls require information and assistance, you know, on any number of fronts from, you know, class members with children to class members with criminal assistance to class members who are, you know, inheriting something from a parent. Um, we also, because we have class who are not placed exclusively within the OPWDD system, um, have to interact with risk managers and counsel at hospitals and nursing homes, with court staff, guardians ad litem who might be appointed with respect to class members, and of course, MHLS. Um, we have been involved for many, many years on the managed care transition because this started in 2012, um, and we're 10 years into a rollout. Um, we do try, and this goes back to Kathy's point, to work collaboratively with the state to assure the compliance issues. Um, we have been pretty successful over the years. No one wants to continue to litigate a case. When an issue results, um, you know, that implicates class members, it does not benefit the class member to have us going to court and taking a number of months to get on a court calendar. Um, to get a resolution. The state understands that too. The state has generally been very, you know, collaborative and collegial in addressing issues. Um, and we go, we have a protocol in place where under the injunction, we're entitled to reach out directly to the commissioner. And Carrie, we have spared you largely that since you're new. Um, but we've had developed over the years um, a sort of triumvirate protocol developed where we are able to access directly to general counsel at the agency. We have a highly placed deputy commissioner who's in charge of programmatic issues so that we can affect an immediate, or we try to affect an immediate <laughs> correction as needed. Um, and we have a Willowbrook liaison who's sort of a general paralegal person um, who, who is supposed to sort of shunt around the information that might be necessary for OPW to have at their hands. Um, when those efforts fail, we resort to the court. And what we've been seeing recently um, is increased activity in the case because there are so many changes occurring at the state level, with the funding levels, with the federal funding, and of course, a workforce crunch that has been many, many, many years 
in the making. The pandemic accelerated a disaster that we have been asking OPW to address for quite some time. Um, we are generally, as I say, trying to and successfully usually resolving without the court's intervention, but that court is a real backstop here. The court in the Eastern District, I think, considers this case to be one of the sort of crown jewels of the cases that the Eastern District has handled. Um, and the Eastern District handles an awful lot of <laughs> drugs and guns and mafia cases. So um, I do think in terms of the civil docket, um, this is a case that the entire court in the Eastern District is dedicated to. Um, doesn't hurt, you know, that Rob Levy, who was my predecessor at NYCLU, is a magistrate judge in the Eastern District. He's not allowed to talk to anybody about the case. Um, but the fact that he was elevated as a magistrate judge from an ACLU affiliate to the federal bar is an unusual circumstance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop now because I can just go on and on because, you know, lawyers talk a lot. Um, but I do want to do sort of an ACLU thing. And, um, you know, you'll probably all roll your eyes. But um, I want to quote Karl Marx. Um, Karl Marx said, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. History repeats itself. The first is tragedy and then it farce. We've seen the history of deinstitutionalization in New York State has fallen into several stages as policies and objectives in the state at the higher echelons have changed over time. The early focus was simply moving people out of state and public institutions, individuals moving from large institutional settings to smaller but still large congregate care settings in the community. Those institutional settings in the community are as isolated from the community as the large institutional settings were. Um, there's been a focus on improving and expanding the range of services and supports for those in the community, recognizing that mere medical treatment is insufficient to ensure community tenure, community presence, and the like. Um, but overall, the progress was glacial. Uh, resources for community care were and continue to be a major issue. I think the progress has effectively stopped at this point. Kathy referenced the size of a wait list for people who really are in need of supported settings, supports and services that guarantee them a right to live in the community. New York State, for a very long time, extended all of the Willowbrook entitlements to all of the people in the state with intellectual disabilities. But as the state and all of us, I think on this call are aware, certainly on the panel, um, OPW has been able to realize or maintain all of the Willowbrook goals, and the recent budget cuts have certainly compromised the state's ability to reach and maintain service delivery goals for everyone. The Willowbrook case was not about setting up a class of people who had been fundamentally abused with a lifetime guarantee of high quality services. The case was not just about that. The case was about setting a system that would serve everyone at the same high level of services. Um, and, you know, it, it is very disturbing to see that promise uh, come undone these days. So I will stop right now. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Beth. That was great. Um, and uh, just before I, uh, Tani um, speaks, I did want to mention based on some of uh, Beth's work that, um, uh, in the past several years, I've worked in, I don't know, seven, eight other states related to consent decrees or, or other, other um, needs that the states had based on my, my, my uh, services. And it was very interesting to me that when, when something came up about a case that they thought was something that only started 20 years ago, it was actually based on what happened at Willowbrook and, and those the, the first um, places that did this. So I would also give, um, give a great deal of, of um, it, I would just appreciate a great deal that the people who worked there and made this stuff happen at the beginning and helped us 
get do get to do all the things we did were um, really a, an amazing group. So um, I'm going to now not make Tani wait any longer and um, just tell you that she, that um, Tani Ferguson is currently the executive director of the Consumer Advisory Board for the Willowbrook class. And she began her career with the CAB in 1990 when she was hired as a CAB representative for the Brooklyn catchment area. During her first year, although her caseload was well over the 100 to 1 ratio established in the Willowbrook Permanence Injunction, she advocated strongly for the men and women she represented. In her initial years, she assisted in the final movements from the developmental centers in Brooklyn and Manhattan for a small number of class members, and she continued her advocacy at multiple levels and worked with family members to ensure success as the men and women settled into their new, new uh, homes. As her career continued, she was an assistant director at the CAB and moved to the position of executive director in 2005. During this time, she has continued to advocate on behalf of the class members while working collaboratively with both state and voluntary providers. The advocacy was centered around the class members' entitlements outlined in the rule of a permanent injunction. So thank you for being here, Tani. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone for taking your Wednesday evening and being here. To the um, men, to everybody at CSI that has created this event, as well as there's a couple of people that are um, prior employees at Willowbrook, I know that also have been very much involved with this, particularly with some of with all of these ongoing events. So thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to the other panelists. And I did want to give a shout out to Carrie. I am really pleased that you are here and that you have stayed for the full panel discussion to hear what all of us have to say. So with that being said, I am going to be the person that's going to speak about the the here and the now. Some of what I'm going to say you've already heard, um, but I do want to say that I think, you know, I want to start with what Kathy and Beth also mentioned, which is collaboration. Collaboration has been key over the years to achieving the different successes that we have achieved. Collaboration doesn't mean that we've always gotten what we want. It also involves negotiation. This is something that is currently lacking, um, but I'm, I'll get into that as we move forward. What I wanted to share with you is something um, that I think Kathy will remember this from back in the day. We have a class member who, and I actually called him today. I, I wanted to talk to him and see what he had to say. I wanted to see what he feels about the system because he was somebody that had a child and we went and we, we helped him fight for the services and he went to court and he won custody of his child. So then this is where one of those collaborations and negotiations came up because we needed an apartment that had two bedrooms <laughs> because it was a little girl and you know we were able to achieve the success we were able to give him those supports and services that he needed to help to, to not help well yeah we helped him also raise his child and what kenny had told me was that yes where he is today is a vast improvement his word wasn't vast. He used quite colorful language when he spoke to me, which I am not going to repeat here, um, but definitely an improvement from where he was in Willowbrook. He is, however, frustrated because everything came to a standstill. And part of this is due to the diminution of services through OPWDD. You know, so when I first started, and as Ronnie said, that was just a few decades ago, um we had services that encouraged people to get jobs we had you know job training there were different agencies that provided other skills where one could learn how to do work we had small employment services we had little workshops those have all been ruled out they weren't considered i can't think of the right word but they weren't being used because they felt that they weren't being the men and women were not being integrated into the community appropriately but by removing those services there's no longer job training available kenny was somebody that when i first met him he was a cook he was a actually he worked in a group home as the cook at see, kathy's remembering <laughs> he, and actually he's a really good cook so but circumstances prevailed and he lost that job but then there was no further training he did a few things. He would go to the library. He did learn computer skills. And to this day, his one goal that he has wanted to, to achieve is to get employed. 
And that just has not been able to happen due to the lack of the services that we've been able to access over the last 10 to 12 years. Um, so I just I wanted to share that story because it really is a good story, but it's also a story that shows over the years what has changed. Um, some of the things I know Beth spoke about were the number of class members. I actually have the exact number, it was 5,449. Um, and right now we just have over 2,000 class members that are still alive. The men and women, like Beth said, are just, everybody lives throughout the whole state of New York, all the way up to the North Country, people out in the Hamptons, Jamestown, New York. And, but as Beth said, the majority are here in New York City. There are some people that still live with families. There are men and women that live in apartments, supportive apartments. Some are living independently on their own. And unfortunately, we have approximately 40 class members currently in a nursing home setting. I would say about a third of those men and women are there because they are on ventilators. And there are no group homes within the state of New York that can support ventilator care and that has, that has not been something we have advocated for because that's such a intense medical level of need. But the remaining men and women that are there, they're waiting because they have feeding tubes or they need their home to be renovated to help them with their accessibility or some just cannot go back to their home. So they need a new home that can accommodate their new needs, such as a wheelchair. This has been a struggle. This has been a struggle now for quite a number of years. It is one of those topics that we talk about whenever the Willow Task Force meets. And it's one of those topics that we don't seem to gain the traction on that we truly do need to gain. Um, this is due to the staffing crisis. This is due to the lack of nurses that want to work in the field. So I am told. And of course, you know, just not having those available resources is limiting the need for the medical care. The direct support staff who are amazing for the, you know, I mean, if you have met, and I'm sure many people on this call have met a number of, you know, your direct support staff, because you probably have, if you have family that live in group homes, they dedicate so much of their lives to the men and women. And I think that, you know, they do do a lot of these services. They do the feeding tubes, they do ileostomy bags. And they're not necessarily provided with the rewards that should be coming with that. I think we all know, because it's one of the biggest things in the budget this year is an increase the direct support professional salary. Over the years, I know on the Willowbrook Task Force, when I became a member of that, one of the other goals that people strive for was a growth system within the direct support staff's professional career to allow them to learn new techniques and then move up to higher grades and higher levels that seems to not to have come to fruition as of yet but again you know hopefully it is something that we can resume that conversation and it is something that we can put in place for those men and women that have dedicated so much of their career to working with not only the class members but the class members peers um one of the things and that when I do advocacy for the class members, one of my favorite paragraphs from the permanent injunction, when it's not to a specific issue, such as due process or appropriate placements, is paragraph 23. Paragraph 23 is the paragraph at the end of the permanent injunction, which, some, which surmises that you know, the class members are not getting, as Beth said, any sort of monetary benefit, but they're supposed to have this high quality lifestyle. They're supposed to have high quality residential services. You know, there's supposed to community inclusion, things that you and I take for granted. You and I, you know, we know that we can sit down and plan our own activities for the evening and we know what we like. It was always an effort to get some of the homes and some of the agencies to understand that, you know, if John wants to go to a Broadway show, we should be making every effort to make that happen. If he wants to go to the opera because he actually did like the opera, then that's what we should be working to make be successful. I remember one time when this was one of the things I had really encouraged and he went and the staff that went with him, the next time I saw him, the staff thanked me because he himself had never been to a Broadway show. So 
he got to not only see John enjoying something he truly loved, but he himself had a new experience. So that was just an aside. Once again, I tend to do that. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to go back to what some of our concerns are with the paragraph 23 is the high quality community residential and treatment services. We talk about due process and we talk about protection from harm. They are all, well, I guess they don't, well, they do run hand in hand, but not specifically. So one of the things with the due process and what we have noticed a huge increase in is what people, both the state and the voluntary providers are calling either emergency placements or a suspension of services. A suspension of service is when they don't have the staff to operate the home or they don't have the nursing and they move people. Unfortunately, the way the process has been handled over this last few years has been traumatic to the men and women um, and their families, because imagine showing up to visit your child and they're packed up and ready to move and you haven't even been notified. It has been a devastating situation because people are not given the opportunity to adjust. When you're moved to a new home, you have an adjustment to go through, but also the staff have to learn everything. And the people who already live in the home are now being inundated with all these new people. They're and taking away the staff from their needs and from their settled life. I mean, you know, you have, we move in another 12 people, it really does create a difference in the home. But I wanted to say that everybody seems to have settled okay in that particular situation, fortunately. But the emergency placements in the past have only have been used when we've had natural disasters or man-made disasters. Now they tend to be used on a much more frequent basis. Um, you know, they somebody fails one fire drill and all of a sudden we get this call and of course it comes after hours that they're being moved. There's supposed to be protocols in place to protect the men and women and to deter agencies from doing this, but it's not happening. And there's no repercussions when the families, I'm sorry, when the providers do this, there, there's just no repercussions whatsoever anymore. There's no, you know, you shouldn't do this. Let's see what we can do. Let's get the guy back to the house. Let's get the lady back to the house. And that is not providing the best services for anyone. And what happens is, so as an advocate, when I bring this up, when I bring forth these concerns, what I have noticed over the last, and I'm not, mine is going pre-pandemic. This all started before the pandemic. The pandemic added another layer to everything. But even before the pandemic, it wasn't as if the advocates were being heard. It wasn't as if the parents were being heard. It was a lot of head nodding of a yes, yes, yes. But then we would meet again and it would be the same exact conversation. Um, one of my board members, and many of you may know Mrs. Ann Nierbauer, she is a long standing board member at the CAB and a very much involved member of the Boulevard Task Force. And one of her ongoing questions and concerns is active treatment, which is falls under paragraph 10 of the permanent injunction. And again, this is one of those conversations, there hasn't been a resolution as of late. You know, the system needs to look at who they are providing services to. The Wilbert class members are definitely an aging population. We have two class members who are currently 100 years old. Um, and as an aside, our oldest lived to 105. May she rest in peace. But I always think that's so cool because people who were institutionalized were not supposed to live this long. They were not supposed to live beyond 30. And here we have people 55 up to 100. And I'm going to tell you, our 200 year old class members are probably more active than I am. So they're just real go getters. You got to love it. But the active treatment has to adjust to what the needs of the men and women are. There should still be physical therapy as people age, especially if you have cerebral palsy, you need to keep your joints moving so that you don't become re more reliant on a wheelchair if you haven't been in one. You have to be able you know, to still use and maintain the skills that you have had to the best of your ability. But these services aren't happening. They're not there. They are, the evaluation will be done and they will then be told, nope, they don't need the service anymore because they are not participating. 
the participation also has to be geared to how that particular person is going to be activated, how they're going to engage. It's not going to be as if you can tell them, let's walk up three steps in some situations, but there has to be another way to work around that. We've had more and more people who have required feeding tubes. When asked about doing speech therapy in a way that will help them maintain their ability to swallow, there is a response that is kind of the um they really don't know what we're talking about or what we're asking about which i find frustrating because i would think a speech pathologist would know some of these various techniques or at least be able to go out and speak to other people and learn them that's part of how we all maintain this advocacy we all work together and we all learn and we go out and we do our research but by not providing these services we are limiting their lives even more which is then causing people to go back further in their in the goals that they have acquired over these so many years. And I mean, I really have seen a lot of people grow throughout the years. I, another really um, nice story to share is Raymond. He was also on my case though when we lived in Brooklyn and when I worked in Brooklyn rather, well, I also lived there at the time. But um, he was one of those, he wanted to be in an apartment. He didn't want to live in the group home with all these other people as he would always tell me. So we had set up his goals that he had to work on and he did. He diligently worked on his goals. He worked on his cooking goals, his, his identifying his money goals. And he also worked on his behavior goals, as we have called them over the years. He achieved all of this and he moved into a two person apartment and had his own bedroom. And I saw him probably about five years ago. And that was the first thing he told me. You helped me get here, but you made sure I worked on my goals. So it's this growth that has motivated not just myself, but it's motivated the class members. It's motivated all of the advocates, the CAB representatives uh, who never leave. I mean, the majority of my staff have been here as long as I have. And, you know, they all get that. The advocacy is just something that is within them and watching so many of these men and women grow. What I think we need to see as we move forward is more developed responses from OPWDD, more active listening from OPWDD, more engagement and conversations, and not just we'll get back to you. And then a week later, following up to see if they're going to get back to me. It is a frustrating process. We are talking about people's lives. If somebody's bill needs to be paid so that they can stay in their house, this isn't something that should be drawn out for a week, a month, or years. It needs to get done. If there is a reason it's not getting done, then there needs to be a, a conversation and it needs to happen as soon as possible. If somebody needs alternate placement because they're in a hospital, because their voluntary provider has left them there, it shouldn't take six months to get them into a placement. This is on the shoulders of OPWDD to work with us to make sure everybody has an appropriate placement. For the men and women that are in the nursing homes, we shouldn't be having these delays in getting so, uh, place, you know, the delays that we're seeing in terms of finding appropriate placements. I know that there's a struggle as homes are closing and as there is such a lack of staff, but not even having the conversations is what is also creating the problem. So, you know, I could go on, I really could, and I can give you more examples of what's happening on a daily basis. But I think that we have, you know, so many other people here today. I, I am more than happy to answer questions as we move forward. And again, I just I want to give a shout out to everybody who is ad, who advocates on behalf of the class members, who advocates on behalf of their family members, because your day to day is frustrating as it is. You're always there is going to be that little glimmer of hope, and that's what's going to keep all of us going. That being said, thank you again for being here.
And it's been a pleasure and I hope I've enlightened some as to where we are today with the system for the class members. Ronnie, you're muted. Um, and with that, um, we'll go back to um, Catherine or Nora. Thank you very much for uh, for all to all of the panelists. You were all wonderful, and thank you for everybody who made this happen. It's it's been really a very good evening. Thank you. I think we're working on. So could you, Grayson? Could you please add the commissioner? And Russell. As uh, well. once they share their cameras, yes. Okay. Excellent. Great. And now we can move to some questions. There are a lot of great questions. So I'm we can't probably answer every single one, but I'm gonna just throw a couple of them out. So one of the questions that came up was a question about how the increase of funds that's anticipated for OPWDD, how that will be allocated, and if there's a plan. And I'll say also other questions that are coming up are about how dealing how to deal with a shortage of staff. And I suspect this might be answerable as part of this question. So I'll throw that open to anyone who would like to reply. Sure. Well, I can start and I'm happy to um, happy to hear anybody else's um, thoughts on that. Um, the additional dollars that are, um, you know, that the governor proposed in her budget that we are obviously anxiously awaiting um, a final enacted budget to see um, how things play out. But the governor's additional dollars are, um, the bulk of those dollars go in two different areas. The first is to a COLA cost of living adjustment that would go directly to our providers to recognize the increased cost of doing business. And this is a piece of law that has been not withstood over the last decade or so, um, with the exception of last year, which, would, which we saw a 1% cost of living adjustment to our providers. Um, so this would be a 5.4% cost of living adjustment, an upward adjustment um, to the contracts that we have in place um, and the rates that are provided um, for various services, including self-direction, um, uh, personal needs allowance, um, et, et cetera. And so that's a, the large portion of the increase to the budget. The second largest portion that we would see would be through the governor's um, uh, proposal to provide bonuses to many levels of staff, not just direct support staff, but several, um, you know, several members of the team who support individuals, um, both in state operations and in the voluntary sector, looking at direct support professionals, various um, you know, types of therapies, various clinical titles to provide an, an up to a $3,000 bonus um, for those staff based on the number of hours that they worked and the duration of their employment. Um, so that's another large area. Um, and that would also, that applies to the larger health and human services sector. So not just to um, the IDD sector. Um, I'm sorry, I just, okay. Um, there are also, you know, several other important investments in the budget. Um, you know, every year we see $15 million in capital appropriated to OPWDD to help with the development of supportive housing. Um, something that we're very excited about is an increase to the housing voucher amount. So that amount hasn't been increased, and I think it's been 12 years since that amount has been increased, and we would be tagging our voucher amount to HUD fair market rent. So on an annual basis, HUD comes out with updated fair market rental values, and we would be adjusting our housing voucher to keep pace with that, which just makes individuals more competitive when they're out there in the private market looking for an apartment on their own or with a roommate. Um, and so we're very excited about that. Something that we are looking to do um, you know, at OPWDD, and I think somebody touched on it when they were speaking, was to make sure that um, all options are available for individuals, right? So if a group home is the right, um, you know, option for an individual and that's an opportunity that an individual wants to pursue or their family would want to pursue, then obviously, you know, a group home should be available. But we have lots of individuals who I think would want to be served and would want to live independently or in supportive housing in the community. And we want to make sure that there is a wealth of opportunities available to them. So Increasing the subsidy amount, you know, really just makes that opportunity, um, you know, more available to individuals. I know specifically in New York City, um, you know, keeping pace and, and being competitive in the rental market can be very difficult. Um, so we're very excited 
um, to be able to, to do that in the budget. Um, there are some other rest, there's some restorations to previous year's cuts. Um, there are, you know, every year we see an additional $30 million added to our budget to allow us to um, keep pace with the increased cost of services and also to accommodate, you know, ad the additional individuals that we're serving, which is, you know, roughly, you know, an additional 2,000 individuals a year or so. So we're very excited, you know, obviously about the budget. And I think what's important about the budget is that a lot of the priorities that are funded in this year's budget came directly from OPWDD providing feedback to the executive chamber, which came to us through our 507 planning process, which I know that um, you know the the CAB and the task force were very um, you know very uh, you know participated in um, you know our stakeholder engagement sessions over the course of the summer and really contributed to the development of the draft 507 plan, which for those of you who don't know is our five-year forward-facing strategic plan. We're excited. Um, we have been providing previews of that strategic plan over the last month, and we will be issuing a draft report in the middle of April, which will then um, you know, provide the community with another opportunity to provide feedback to us on our strategic plan before we release a final. Um, and so I think to the extent that um, you know, we use that feedback that went into our strategic planning process to inform the executive chamber about our priorities, I believe that the governor's budget is really representative of the priorities of our system, our larger community, and how we want to move forward. Um, and so I think I probably answered both the questions that you posed there in terms of how we'll be spending the dollars and the ways in which we're looking to support, um, at least from a financial perspective, our direct support professionals. I would want to also mention that there are a few other opportunities. I guess the one silver lining that I see of COVID is the way that the federal government um, has provided us with lots of opportunities um, in the form of funding, um, you know, really to be able to use in creative ways, um, what, you know, specifically, you know, around ensuring community-based services are available to the individuals that we serve. And so OPWDD, because of the large amount of Medicaid spending that we do, we've been the beneficiaries of you know a significant increase in our federal match which we have been able to use in lots of great ways um, the largest way that we're using that is again going directly to our direct support professionals um, in the form of you know different types of bonuses and the vast majority of that money just went out over the last two weeks and there will be additional dollars that are following in the next month or so um, but some of the other exciting opportunities that we've had that we are pursuing are also ways to continue to help professionalize and support our direct support professionals, um, looking specifically at ways to provide credentialing opportunities and ways to provide professional development to our DSPs who we know are so dedicated to the work that they do. And we really want to be able to provide career ladders, opportunities for professional development and opportunities for these individuals to grow in their careers and spend that career with us in our system, right? Continuing to support um, and you know working their way up and you know, I'm a social worker by education. I started my career in direct support and I've been able to right, grow my career in this field and have it be very rewarding for me. And I think it's very important to be able to provide that opportunity to the people that we serve. And I know that one of the things that you know, I value in my, you know, from my experience as a policymaker is being able to draw on my experience working directly with individuals and their families. And I think it's really important as we grow our, um, as we grow our professional development that we are providing those opportunities for individuals. Some of the other things that we're doing is working on creating a pipeline. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, and especially now, right, we're facing the great recession and we're in a time where people really have, you know, they can choose whatever they want to do right now, right? The job market is wide open for people um, and wanting to help, um, you know, spread the word about, you know, why choose this career, right? Why does, why is this for the right person? Why is this a really meaningful career to get into? And so I think that for us, that means, you know, really, um, you know, you know, working on a marketing campaign and really spreading the word about what it is that we do here in this field. And then also working directly with people where they are, whether that be in high school or in college, to create a pipeline of individuals to come into our field and then to be able to support them so that they stay. Um, so that's some of the, you know, sort of the non, you know, compensation ways that we really are looking to support our workforce and really grow our workforce and grow the ranks of professionalism. That's great to hear because the other questions that are coming in have to do with people interested in 
how they as legal students or law students may be able to be part of this process of advocacy or other areas as well. So I know we're at 7.30, which is supposed to be our end time, but I hate to cut it off because there are a number of questions. If we can stay on maybe for another five minutes, if people will be willing to do that. And I'm just going to throw that question out. How can people who are maybe law students or students who are going to move into a professional career, how can they get involved as students? Um, so certainly in the New York City metro area and around the state at different law schools, um, there are disability justice clinics and programs um, down here in the city, for example, Brooklyn Law School and New York University um, and CUNY uh, over in Queens um, have very, very active um, disability law clinics um, where students with their professors um, take on cases in various courts. It can be, you know, anything from, you know, parental rights, right, for a person to um, guardianships or landlord tenant events. Um, so there's that opportunity. Um, oftentimes, you know, and I would encourage um, students to um, look to local um, surrogate court practices because for better or worse, a lot of people with IDD are coming through the surrogate courts where families are directed by the state education department, the city department of education to file for guardianship under 17A over their family member. Um, that I could talk about that for forever. Um, guardianship should be a condition of last resort, but there are a lot of law students engaged in um, assisting families and individuals in trying to avoid a 17A guardianship um, or at least tailor the scope of the guardianship. Um, Always, you know, young people in law school um, should apply for clerkships, um, you know, Eastern District, Southern District, um, up in the North Country, uh, obviously Northern District out West. Um, you know, I would definitely, you know, look and then sort of get on to various uh, listservs. We also have a protection advocacy entity in the state that covers every disability. So we've got the PAD, which is Protection and Advocacy for People with Developmental Disabilities, the PAMI, People with Mental Illness. Um, they do work for people with traumatic brain injury. Um, They're an educational entity as well as a direct services advocacy entity. So that's a place to look. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. The Human Rights Commission, the State Human Rights Commission, local county human rights commissions, the New York City Human Rights Commission, um, all areas where people can explore um, advocating and working in disability justice spaces. Catherine, if I may, I think also we should get information out that so many agencies and entities in the state have programs where they have internships and partner various educational facilities, um, as well as recruiting from those um, locations. Um, in some of the agencies I'm familiar with, including HRC, I think we have internship programs for every discipline, from nurses to speech service, to PT, to OT, to DSPs. Uh, we bring in high school kids, and we do have some lawyers that are getting uh, involved in our legal uh, guardianship program as well. So those entities, if we can get information out in any way, let me know if I can help. And I was going to say there's also various, you know, smaller agencies that might have board vacancies and they're looking for students that may be towards the end of their career. That's also another option um, to help with the advocacy. All right, and then I just I'll throw out one last one and it's there's a lot of interest in what services are guaranteed for non class members when the consent judgment ends and what can be done to extend outings and opportunities for fresh air for people who are in nursing homes now, for instance. So the consent judgment actually only applies to Willowbrook class members. So those were the people who were actually on the grounds or returned from a developmental center um, as of 1973. Um, but, you know, as I said, it the intent was to float the boat for everyone um, so that, you know, everyone should be entitled to every single aspect, because remember the, the consent judgment 
laid the groundwork and set the system up. So high quality residential, absolutely. Least restrictive setting appropriate to a person's needs, absolutely. Meaningful programming, day, meaningful recreation, high quality medical, all of these services exist to be available to everyone based on their need and their desires. You know, as the commissioner said, not everybody wants to be in a certified setting. Um, independent living or supported living um, is certainly an option. We have class members who live outside the OPW certified settings um, in assisted living facilities, for example, where they're there with elderly peers who share common interests. Um, all of that is, is available. The system is teed up to person-centered planning where the individual is supposed to be at the center of all the planning so to kathy's earlier point willowbrook was one size fits all everyone's in there and they got what they didn't get <laughs> everyone didn't get anything um, you know the system should in fact be elastic to accommodate the needs the desires the growth the support that every individual deserves to be able to have the most fulfilling life um, and certainly to be protected from harm, um, which I always refer to. Thank you so much. I'm so I, sorry that we don't have hours more. So, did somebody want to speak? I'm sorry. Tawny, did you well, want to Well, I was speak? just going to say, I mean, for, certainly for the, the nine, oh, I'm sorry, Tawny, I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> you know, our, our commitment obviously is, is to continue, right, with, and, and I think, you know, all the directions in, that we are moving in is really to provide and promote least restrictive, right? Most community integrated, both from our housing options and our residential programs and our day programs, and to really continue and move our system in the direction of, um, you know, integrating in the most meaningful ways possible individuals with every level of disability into their community in whatever way their ability supports that. Um, and obviously, we'll continue you know, 50 years from now, you know, we'll still have 105 year old class members kicking around, um, you know, based on what Tawny's telling us. Um, and we'll obviously continue to work with our partners and we have very, you know, really involved and, you know, we're grateful for that partnership. And I think, you know, just being on the government side, right, there are checks and balances to everything that we do, right? And we can't do the best job that we do without our partners, you know, checking us and, and working with us to make sure that we're always moving and motivated to continue to move in the the right direction. So I think we have a really important um, relationship, you know, that will continue, you know, hopefully, you know, many, many, many years after the, the consent degree is, is no longer with us. So I had just wanted to respond. I think Catherine, you said somebody was asking about people getting out into the fresh air. And um, I think one of those is just, I mean, if it's, it's the advocacy, it's making sure that you're doing the phone calls, doing the follow up. One of the things I used to do was I would actually help assimilate the information and then just it was the continuous follow up and I, there are times when it's daily. Um, I mean community inclusion is going to vary depending on what the person's needs are if it's just going and sitting outside, especially as the weather gets nicer. You know, just go over find that staff person that you trust and can work up that relationship and you'll have somebody that will be willing to take that person out on a much more regular basis as well. Thank you. That's great advice. Well, I, I can't thank you all enough. It's been really wonderful to hear this. I've learned so much from you all tonight. And obviously the audience is very appreciative of everything that you have to share with us. And I do want to also thank Anna and Nicole, our interpreters, for their amazing service. <laughs> it's been really wonderful to watch. And thank you so much for that. And I'm going to turn it back over now to Nora Santiago, who will tell you a bit about our next event. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who attended this event tonight. Uh, all our wonderful speakers and, and all our audience, there were some, so many great questions. I would like to thank everyone who helped organize this event and ensure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, don't forget about our next event. It's going to be on May 18. There is the information in the chat. Uh, you can just click on the link to register. Uh, it's going to call inside the cages, breaking the Willowbrook story. Um, you will also receive an email after this event with the registration link and um, the recording to this event if you want to watch it again. Please follow us on Eventbrite so you can be notified of any upcoming events. And um, 
I hope to see you all next month. Um, have a good night. Thank you.